But if you have a Bible, uh, do turn there now. Luke 15 in the New Testament. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back, safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. 
Lord, let it speak to us in fresh ways this morning. Bring it alive in our hearts this morning. And may this word which is living and active, which has power to transform, change every heart gathered here this morning. Amen. Stories of things being lost and found again are deeply compelling to us as human beings. Stories of valuable things that have been lost and then found again are often in the news. It's fascinating whenever there's a big discovery of buried treasure or artifacts, historical artifacts, often in the news. Ancient coins, treasure troves, shipwrecks like Shackleton's Endurance, which was found last year, or treasures lost more recently. A couple of months ago, there was great excitement when the earliest full live recording of a Beatles gig emerged, recorded at Stowe School 70 years ago. Beautiful historical artifact, something that everyone thought was lost, suddenly emerges. Missing persons, especially lost children, always make the headlines, don't they? We continue to be fascinated and deeply troubled by the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, 16 years on. The search still ongoing. Anytime there's a hint of a new breakthrough, a new clue, it makes the news. And perhaps we're so captivated by stories like these because we've all had a taste of what it's like to lose something which is very precious to us and not be able to find it. It's awful. Perhaps you've got your own story of having lost a child at a theme park (laughs) or a shopping center, as we have. And the wave of relief that hits you when you realize it's okay, they're safe. So it's perhaps not at all surprising that perhaps the most famous parable of all of Jesus' parables is a story of a child being lost and found again. We call it the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son, but we should call it the parable of two sons, both of whom are as lost as each other. And it's important that we set the story in its proper context because these three stories belong together. The parable of the lost sons is the third of three parables which Jesus tells in a row. Perhaps we can have the verses, uh, the first few verses on the screen again to set the scene because the context is so, so important. Verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them, and Jesus told them a parable. Now, Jesus is teaching, and Luke tells us there are two distinct groups of people gathered to hear him. First group, tax collectors and sinners. Second group, the Pharisees who are muttering. Two very different types of people, two different types of people who you would not normally find at the same place at the same time. But Jesus, because of the power of his personality and his wisdom and his love and his compassion, draws them together. He does, doesn't he? Luke doesn't mention, though, a third group of people who were there. And we know there was a third group of people there because they were the ones who wrote the story down. They were the disciples observing watching everything Jesus did, learning to do what he did, making notes. The reason we know they were there is because we have this gospel text. They were eyewitnesses to what was going on, and they were figuring out what was going on here. Then, just as now, Jesus' disciples are involved in the action. And I think there is a connection between the two types of people Jesus is addressing in the two shorter stories and the two sons he talks about in the third. A connection that Jesus wants us, the disciples, who are listening, to see and to respond to. Yes, this is a story for the tax collectors and the sinners. This is a story for the Pharisees. But this is also a story for the disciples, people like us. And I want to show you why. Firstly, the story of the lost sheep. Sheep. Sheep are precious. If you were at the Suffolk show this week, you know they are still precious. Agriculture, farming, such an important part of our economy, 
still today. But in that day, sheep had a different kind of function. They weren't just the property of a farmer. Sheep were a bit like an investment, capital, like money in the bank. And shepherds didn't own the sheep. Shepherds just looked after the sheep. They were caretakers. They were property managers. They were the ones who did the dirty work of looking after the sheep, keeping them clean and safe. But the sheep themselves belonged to someone else, someone who was wealthy. Every sheep was precious, but every sheep also mattered to the shepherd because he was responsible for them. So much so that if one went wandering off, the shepherd would leave 99 together in the wilderness to go and find that one. It was an important job, and it was personal to them. The shepherd knew all his sheep. The shepherd knew their characteristics. He knew what they were all like, and he knew about little Wooly, who had a tendency to be distracted and go wandering off on his own and possibly get stuck on a ravine or stuck in a hedge and need rescuing, or worse. And the shepherd would gladly go looking for Wooly, out of concern for the one. And when he did, he was so delighted to have him back, both because of his responsibility, but also because of his personal connection to that sheep, that he would put him on his shoulders, run home, and have a party to celebrate. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks about being sent to the lost sheep of Israel. It was his mission to go after the sheep who had wandered away from the flock and bring them home to the Father rejoicing. In the same Gospel, Jesus sends his disciples again. He says, go to the lost sheep of Israel. Who were the lost sheep of Israel? They were the sinners, the tax collectors, the harlots, the backslidden, the ones who were meant to be faithful to God, but were no longer. They were the ones who were Jewish culturally, but who had abandoned Torah and the religion of their fathers. And it's very clear to me that Jesus in this story is addressing the tax collectors and the sinners. He is sharing God's heart for them as his lost sheep, who he will go after and rescue and bring home rejoicing. He might say that you found Jesus, you found Jesus. You found Jesus on an Alpha course, or you found Jesus in a Bible study, or you found Jesus growing up in a Christian home, but the real truth of the matter is Jesus found you. Jesus came and found you, came into your wilderness and found you. It was all grace. It was all his generous love. You were the lost sheep, and Jesus came looking for you. How about the second story, the parable of the lost coin? Here too, the woman this time has lost something of great value. Perhaps it was part of her inheritance. It is no small thing to lose a tenth of your income. This month is giving month when I'm asking each of us to look at our regular giving to St. Augustine's. Many of us will tithe what we receive each month as our part of our salary of our Pension And those of us who know what it feels like to tithe means, know it means it's no small thing. You feel it. You think about the other things you could be doing with that money. And the woman here has lost a tenth of all she owns. She feels it. And just as the story of the lost sheep was a story for the tax collectors and the sinners, I think this story of the lost coin is a story for the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ones who tithed religiously legalistically, in fact. It wasn't about generosity for them. It wasn't a gracious response to all that God has done for us as our tithing should be. It was motivated purely by keeping rules, fear of being punished if you didn't. You should never give for that reason. But right here and right now, this was Jesus saying to the Pharisees, the upright ones, the religious ones, the legalists, God is coming looking for you too. You might look like you've got it all together. You might look like you're following God faithfully. But he's coming looking for you too. He's lit a lamp. He is sweeping the house top to bottom, making a diligent search for your heart as well. Jesus loved the Pharisees. He hated their self-righteousness. He hated their hard-heartedness. 
He hated their opposition to him and their resistance, certainly, but he loved them too. He saw that they were just as lost as the tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus came to find religious people too, thank God. Every religious person that was lost that God finds again brings joy to his heart. There is rejoicing in heaven whenever someone whose heart is hardened by religion, by duty, is softened again towards the heart of the Father. So now, lost sheep, lost coin, we are set to hear and hopefully understand the parable of the lost son, or as I say, the lost sons, because there are two sons in the story. One of them is the wild, reckless, prodigal son who heartlessly says to the father, give me my inheritance now. In other words, looks at him square in the face and says, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. Give me what you're going to give me when you die. It's so scandalous, so grievous. When Jesus would have told this story, there would have been a sharp intake of breath. There would have been a, (gasps) he didn't really say that, did he? Reaction. Nobody in that day, in that society, when it mattered so much who your father was, would ever have the gall to say to their father, give me what you're going to give me when you die. But this boy does. And just as shocking, actually, is that the father exceeds. That the father says, yes, okay. Verse 13 tells us what happens next. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. The lad went far away. He, like the sheep, wandered off went his own way, taking with him wealth, which didn't really belong to him. The lost sheep was valuable, but it belonged to someone else. He never realized it, that he was hugely precious, much more precious than the money he spent. And I think we're meant to see that the younger son, the lost sheep, In God's mind, these are the sinners. These are the tax collectors. These are the ones who have wandered away from God. Well, the younger son eventually hits rock bottom. He comes to his senses. By the grace of God, he comes to his senses. The money's all been spent. He realizes there's nothing else to go. Out of desperation, he returns to his father. And there is such rejoicing in the father when he sees him, even from a long way off. He runs to meet him, puts his arms around him, embraces him, and fully, we're meant to see here with the the, the ring and the sandals and the cloak and the party, we're meant to see he's being fully restored as a son. The father won't accept him back as a slave, as a servant. He's fully restored as a son right there in that moment. But something needs to be done By taking the inheritance, the son broke off the family connection. He's got no rights to anything anymore. So the father effectively re-adopts him as a son. It's not just that he overlooks the offense. He makes him a son again. And he does it gladly. He does it joyfully. So much so, he throws a party. Do you see, with the lost sheep and the lost son, Jesus is addressing the tax collectors and the sinners, and he's saying to them, come home, all is forgiven, you can be my child again. As I say, though, there are two sons in the story. What about the other son? What about the one who was left behind at the farm? This is the older brother who gets wind of the party going on back at the ranch and who is clearly furious about this, furious that his brother has come home, furious that he's wasted all that money, furious that he's been welcomed back as a son again, part of the family again, whose heart has drifted so far from the father's. Do you see? He is just as lost. He's the one who separated himself from the father because he won't come in to the party. His father has to go out to find him. Listen to these painful words. Verses 28 to 30. 
the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. We see, don't we? It is not just the younger brother who is lost. The older brother is lost too. The younger brother thought it would be better to come back as a slave, but the older brother feels like he's been a slave the whole time. The older brother has made obedience and duty and rule following the substance of his relationship with his father, not love. The fact that he can't receive the father's love when the father goes out to him proves it. His heart is just as far away from the father as the younger brother's was when he left the farm. And it seems to me that the lost coin and the older brother are the Pharisee, the religious folks. The younger brother was lost a long way from home, but the older brother was home the whole time and still just as lost. The older brother was lost, just like the coin, inside the house. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? We can be in the house. We can be part of God's family. We can be religiously observant. We can be churchgoers. We can be Bible readers. We can be those who pray, and yet still our hearts can be lost still our hearts can be cold towards God. You can be a lifelong Christian and still lost if your heart is hard towards God, if your worship is legalistic and duty-bound, if you feel like you're just slaving away, you're just like the older brother. If your walk with God is just coming out of a place of habit and duty, the worship of God and the word of God doesn't stir your heart into love and generosity, you are the older brother. You're inside the house, but you're lost. If your walk with God at the moment feels like you're just slaving away, if it's all just about doing, 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 you're the older brother. But the invitation to you is the same as the Father's. Come back into the party. Come back inside. Come back into my love. Finally, I said that there are three groups of people listening to Jesus that day. The tax collectors and the sinners, who I believe Jesus associates with the lost sheep and the younger son. We have the Pharisees, who I believe Jesus mentally associates with the lost coin and the older son. The third group of people listening that day were the disciples. What did they make of this? And what do you, as a disciple of Jesus, make of this? I think if Jesus' words were effective that day, if they are effective Today, as we encounter them together again today, we are meant to see ourselves somewhere here. Are we the lost sheep or the lost coin? Are we the younger brother or the older brother? Are we the reckless prodigal son or the hard hearted, cold? legalistic Pharisee. We are all lost somewhere. The good news for us today is the Father says, come home. Let's ask a moment. Let's take a moment to ask the Lord where we are in this story today. Let God's word do its work on our hearts this morning.
Lord, show us, I pray, where our hearts have either deliberately wandered away from you and we've found ourselves lost or because we've allowed our hearts to grow cold towards you and we found ourselves just as lost. If you're neither of those this morning, rejoice, but I know I'm one of them. In fact, I know I'm both this morning. I know that I have willfully sinned this week. And I know my heart is not on fire with love for God the way it should be. How about you? Holy Spirit, come and do your work this morning and bring us to a place of repentance, either for our sin or for our cold heartedness, for our pride. And as we prepare our hearts to come around the Lord's table, Prepare them, Lord, to receive the welcome of your love, the embrace of your love again. Open arms of the Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you did for us what we could not do. You came looking for us, whether we were far off in a far land, lost in our own sin, or whether we were in the house the whole time, and yet in a place of hard-heartedness. Thank you that you came looking for us, that you called to us today, come on home. Help us this morning to respond in the right way for each of us. And as we receive bread and wine this morning, that our hearts would rejoice with our brothers and sisters at your reckless, abundant mercy. Amen. Would you stand with me? And we're